Well, for starters, of course, um, Steiner gave a cycle of lectures on economics. And uh, that was called for by a group of students who said, you know, help us think through a new, some new thinking about economics. Uh, of course, it was a time of total economic disaster. Is this after the First World War? Yes, yeah. right. Uh, so uh, he was really struggling to convey both threefold concepts and then the economic concepts within the framework of the threefold. So uh, the greatest challenge was to say, what's our relationship to money? What's its real role? What's its service? Because it had gotten so inflated and diluted and people were didn't know what the value of money was uh, or the value of things or the value of labor. So it was a deep time of deep struggle to get re-rooted in in true economic life. So he really saw, I think, that as an opportunity to recast the whole of economics and how we think about it. So uh, first and foremost, uh, he really felt that people needed to work out of the concept of interdependence in the economic realm, which is different than the rights realm, different than the spiritual cultural realm. That was the threefold piece. And what did interdependence mean? Well, first, uh, he was, I think, the first to really talk about a one world economy. And this is a time when he didn't really know that much about the Southern Hemisphere particularly, uh, and yet he could see that whatever happened in one place affected the whole rest of the world, from purely from an economic standpoint and a natural resource perspective. Um, he could already see capitalism moving uh, around the globe, labor markets being moved. Uh, so he was already seeing from a phenomenological perspective what was happening, and he said, we have to really rethink now, in a typical way, he said, the only way to understand economics is to be within it rather than outside it. So how to be both a participant in it, because we're, I don't know how anybody's outside the economy because we don't work for ourselves, but then have enough distance from it to also be able to picture it from a phenomenological perspective, to understand the flow, because it was really all about the flow and what I call the value chain of events. So every transaction, whether it was purchase, loan, or gift, every transaction was part of a value chain. And by that I mean is that I don't come to a transaction to get something that I need. Actually, every transaction creates value for both parties. And that was pretty revolutionary thinking at the time um, because it was about the circulation of the money, not about the accumulation. So very much a key piece to his thinking was how does money serve human initiative and keep things moving? How does it support it? Um, so that's one part of it. That's a key parse, piece of what RSF social finance does. Our, our goal is not about accumulating resources, but how do we bring resources into circulation and in service to human initiative? So that brings about both the lending activities that we do um, the giving, the grant making that we do, uh, and we serve as an intermediary. So our job is to kind of help facilitate the movement. Because money tends to get stuck, doesn't it? People stick money in the bank or wherever, and it doesn't circulate. And is that the problem? Uh, well, it's a bit of a myth to think that it gets stuck in a bank because uh, it looks that way because you put your money in and you get it back out. But the bank is actually using it to lend out to other people, in some cases quite leveraged. Um, so fractional lending is part of the banking practice. So by that I mean a bank gets one dollar from you and that allows them to lend nine dollars out, right, on the, on the piece of the deposit. So we uh, really feel like that is both um, not a true relationship, right, because that's actually, a, a, I would say, somewhat of an artificial, artificially created value because uh, it's based on the assumption that only one person would want their dollar back at any given time. So from an RSF social finance perspective, we don't leverage in that way. We have investors who place money here, and that's the money that goes out in loans on a somewhat mostly one-to-one -one relationship. We may you know, have to supplement a little bit here and there, but we would not leverage those resources or, or take loans and sell them off and rebundle them for securitize. It, it's really about how we can make those relationships personal and transparent and direct and based on long-term relationships. So it's really money serving relationship rather than relationship serving the accumulation of capital. So we've sort of inverted the paradigm. I, but that's one way I, I look at it. Because the problems that have been happening in the last few years have been created, have they not, by people not doing that? And then, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, one could, um, do an analysis based on the qualities of money and the qualities of transactions that Steiner talked about. And, and again, this is something we work with all the time, which is 
there is purchase money, those that's for buying and selling, and then there's uh, loan money, which, which I actually loan out, right? And it's returned sometimes with interest, so that keeps us in relationship. Uh, at the same time, um, it's based on trust. It enables you to do something that has some generating economic value, both for you and the return of the funds back, or in, or in giving. Um, so there's a relationship between those three. Most of us have that quite separated in our, our brains. So the typical ph philanthropist said, I have to make all my money so that at the end of my life I can give it away. And that creates a kind of a separation of function rather than saying, well, what if I were to give some portion of that on an ongoing basis back into the cultural sector, actually give it away? Because the gift actually creates a new cultural capacity. Uh, whereas, say, the economic activity is in some ways using people up to generate surplus capital. So if you're constantly just generating surplus capital and accumulating it, you're also just using people up. So the gift has to move back into the cultural sector, education, arts, all those things that we thrive on to renew ourselves. So the challenge of our current society. So that's Steiner saying here's this flow of money and the different qualities back and forth. And the analysis of current culture is it's all locked up in investment. And not only in investment, but investments on investments and then derivatives and you know multiple layers of these invented, magnificently creative, but invented tools for people to hold on to it instead of sending it back as a as gift back into the sphere. So the whole cultural sector is just starving to death. Right? And capital is accumulating to fewer and fewer people. So it, it not only is a good way to think about the money, and one could also say, you know, how on an individual basis, how am I thinking about it? How am I working with my philanthropic? And, and do I have to be rich to be a philanthropist? No. I mean, we give time, we give money. You know, what, what does the earning make possible by way of gift back? Um, so that's the reciprocity. Yeah. yeah. The essence of what he was saying about money is that it has multiple functions, and it's not a singular thing. The challenge of our cultures is we have money, so we think of it as a thing. And right away he's saying, don't think of it as a thing. It is actually a holder of, a marker of value. Uh, in a way, it holds all of the division of labor. I mean, all the different economic activities, things that I do, you do, we all do for each other, those are all co-present in any money at any given time. So one can take a look at that dollar bill and say, wow, many, many people have touched this. And it's passed through different phases, whether it's you know, purchased or loan or gift, and it's moving in circulation. But it also represents all of our economic capacity as a, as a holder of value, as a kind of a universal standard in a way. That is a, a, to me, that's very spiritual. How do we hold that picture within this thing that looks like it's a printed piece of paper that also says it's legal tender, right? So there's a certain right attached to it as well. Um, so that's one thing the money is, and the other is actually a capacity for trade, for establishing value, for creating agreements. Um, so we have governments issuing money, but governments don't have to issue. I mean, people can issue money. Any agreement that we want to form, we can issue currency around. You know, but we come to work under the myth, uh, and I would have to say um, the banking industry has fostered the myth that there's only one currency. Right, which is the federal in the U.S. federal currency, or whether it's the pound or or, or the euro, or otherwise, and and that they only are the ones who have the right to issue that. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, Steiner didn't specifically talk about complementary currencies, but he certainly talked about ways of creating economic circulation that wasn't tied specifically to a governmental standard of of exchange. In so, his time, his ideas weren't particularly taken up, were they? After the First World War? Well, the, I mean, from, um, they were from the perspective of, I would say, the, the Steiner community. So, for example, um, the society actually is the primary owner, the society being a not-for-profit not charity, is the primary owner of Valeda. And that was created as a kind of economic activity that would generate income to support the, the um, the more charitable cultural level of work. So that was already kind of a threefold thinking. How do we, as an entity, create these, um, these corporations, right? Or these activities, enterprises that can generate capital that are already intentionally structured to come back into, rather than to accrue to the stockholder, 
what if the stockholder was a public entity, so it had public benefit? So those, those ideas were taken up, and there were some other attempts of that uh, as well. Um, I mean, we're also thinking about that in terms of our own, own planning, so we being RSF social finance, of what could we do to continue to build out our enterprise activities, right? The lending activities, our investment activities that could then begin to fund the granting activity so that we're not dependent on other parties to be able to do that. So we can actually model this economy that we're talking about in, in micro, in the same way that, a, say, a biodynamic farm is a, has the biodiversity that's the thriving. We also want to model sort of mm, money, money form diversity, right, that shows that that circulation can actually work and help the world at the same time as opposed to benefit individuals. John, can I ask you, and this is a, a more general question to end with, really, but the film we're making is called The Challenge of British China. Mm -hmm. what, what do you see as the essence of that challenge? Mm -hmm. Challenges? Yeah. I, um, I think the greatest challenge, because I mean, I work with the material as much as I humanly can, and I work with others to help them work with the material, and the greatest challenge is what I would call a, a, a rather drastic paradigm of thinking. First, it's an imaginative thinking. It's pic it takes picture thinking. So we have uh, Goethe, who was, of course, a great inspiration for Steiner, saying, I see my ideas, right? So what does that mean? That's a picture, picturing capacity, right, that says not only can I generate this imagination, but I can have an objective relationship to it. Uh, that is not... Uh, uh, we don't spend a lot of time in our culture training that kind of thinking. I mean, Waldorf education, I think, is geared toward that in many ways. So um, to think, for example, uh, the, the example that I use is if you take three primary colors, you have red, yellow, and blue. So we know primary colors and secondary colors are a mixture of any two primary colors. So that means that actually when you look at a primary and the, the opposite secondary. So you have yellow and then blue and, uh, blue and yellow are making green, you have red on the other side of that. So you're actually looking, there are two colors there, but you're actually looking at three, right? Because the green is a mixture of the blue and the yellow, okay? And we also know that when you look at red, we experience the after image of that. So we see, if you take the red away, you see the green. We're actually experiencing the green simultaneously with the red. So even when we're looking at three, we're seeing all three primary colors. So that, how do we know, if, for example, in social theory, if we're looking at the economic, you can't think of the economic realm without being awake to the spiritual, cultural realm or the realm of rights. It's there by, by after image. That's a different kind of thinking. How do we bring that present in any conversation to know where we are such that if we're maybe having a conversation about an agreement that we are, we know we're equal, but suddenly we move into a cultural kind of conversation around knowledge base, and now we're not equal, suddenly, and we move through these all the time. And instead saying, well, what are your needs and how do I meet that? That's an economic conversation, and the rules are different. We're not equals in that moment. It's really about how we think through this together. So it's interdependence or brotherhood or the language we use is interdependence. That's a very different kind of thinking of how do you hold polarities. And everywhere in Steiner's work is this third place that holds polarities. It's brilliant. Um, I mean, I could say more. I can give you some examples. Uh, Goethe's observation, for one, said wherever two polarities meet in nature, rhythm emerges. So you have water and sand. Well, you get waves, right? So in the human body, you have the head, which is designed to be as still as possible, and you have the limbs, which are constantly moving around. And the mediator is the rhythmic system, right? And that holds both polarities, right, in that dialogue back and forth. So as human beings, we have to, we have to live in this place where we can hold polarities in the same way. To be awake to those polarities, but be enough above it that we can say, how do we keep a rhythm between those? So rather than saying, it's good guys and bad guys. No, right? Instead, hot and cold, actually, can we talk about temperature? Right? So it's a place that actually can hold both of those. And that is a new kind of thinking. Brilliant. <laughs> Are people interested in what you're trying to do?
Well, I, what we found is more and more people who are, first of all, sort of fed up with the system as it is because they know it's somewhat broken. Um, they sense some of the injustice, even if they're on the kind of winning side of it, they still sense that there's something unjust about it and certainly opaque and inaccessible and um, as impersonal as could possibly be. And what we find is people responding to this idea that every transaction be personal and direct, transparent, based on long-term relationship. People say, I get that. That's what I, where I want to be. So I think we've been pretty clear about what we're trying to do. And that in fact, the money is really to serve human initiative. But the world has shifted. And there are more and more people who are really interested in how finance can really be social. Um, oftentimes, they're asked, well, what's, I don't get social and finance. Why are you guys called social finance? And the idea is actually that the finance is designed to support the evolution of community in a new way because we're all in this together and that is a big change but it's a message that's really resonating with people they really want to say i need to do that i, I know i'm living my life i'm trying to align all my values i'm trying to dig into this deeply but where are the places to do this with my money and they're finding us so I mean, to me, that's what I would want to add because there, that has been a change. And I would say the last, well, certainly the financial meltdown, um, that crisis has raised a lot of, first of all, it woke a lot of people up uh, in not very pleasant way and caused a lot of pain. But then also, I think people are starting to say, there has to be another way of thinking about this. And we've been at it for 26 years, 27 years. So I think we're perceived as a leader in the field in that way of bridging out, saying, very consciously, we have a spiritual basis to what we do. We look at money as both things that can make things happen in the material world, but it actually has a spiritual component. And how do those two breathe together? It's again back to this idea of there, there may be material and spiritual, but they're constantly breathing in a dialogue. And how do we hold that and help others to be in that place? So it isn't just, oh, that they're spiritual over there or they're terrible materialists, but in fact, they can be co-present. And Steiner foresaw these fundamental problems really quite a long time ago. Oh, very much so. I mean, his analysis of uh, his analysis of the economy of the time, which is as simple as saying economics has nothing to do with geopolitical boundaries, right? I mean, he said this idea that a state should govern an economy, it makes no sense. The state, of course, has to make sure the rights are managed once those agreements are, are done. But in fact, most economies don't, don't respect boundaries. In fact, most real economies are doing everything they can to sort of eliminate geographic boundaries or geopolitical boundaries. Uh, and instead, the economies tend to operate in what I would call geological boundaries, right? Where there is a circulation of natural resources, whether it's across a country boundary or across, you know, that is irrelevant where there are needs close by that one can provide that the other needs, so they begin to trade. That is not about political boundaries. That's really about uh, space and distance and location and place. So economics opens, operates in a very different way. You know, and if people are left free to come together in association, to find the entrepreneurs so that they really trust to manufacture them and then talk with them, whether it's in agriculture or otherwise, to set price that meets everybody's needs. It's come to be a very different economy. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was really talking about early on, that it's how can the, the authoring of economic life actually come from the people who are participating in it. And that well, was radical. Because I think for many people, you know, it's become almost a dirty word, yeah. economics. Yeah. Yeah, and, and governments have made pretty much a mess of it in many ways. Um, I mean, it's, it's a very long and complicated conversation because, you know, who gets elected into government and how does that happen? So, the, you know, the monetary influences are very clear in, in, in how the power gets created. And I'm speaking mostly of U.S. analysis. But uh, to me, I think it, it is the capacity that we can take back to create or author our own and feel responsible for our own exchanges and how we create that. Um, so, for example, when we RSF sets interest rates, we bring our borrowers and our lenders and RSF together. And we talk about what's the right interest rate, what are our needs all together. That's an associative picture 
We don't need a third party out there saying, here's interest rates are set by some governmental agency. Don't. We can do that ourselves. You know? And you do that. Yes, we do. Yeah. And it's quite extraordinary. It's, and, uh, you know, to hear borrowers saying, I'm willing to pay a quarter percent more interest because I hear now as an investor, your money is making this, my project possible. And, and I can see that you, and you're living on some of the interest income from that. So I want to make sure you have enough. So the, suddenly the picture of interdependence is very real for people because they're real human beings. And it's not some anonymous institution that's sort of generating this. It's really people. Wonderful. Yeah, so that's, an, that's an, a small associative picture. And hopefully, um, I would love to think that in, you know, in 20 years that all economic life happens that way. A bit idealistic perhaps, but hey. <laughs>The Cassius Green Hospital site is owned by the government. It's been empty since 1993 when the National Health Service closed down the hospital. And Gloucestershire Land for People, which is the local community land trust, has worked with the government since 2004 to develop a housing scheme here. Um, and so we've got a partnership with a developer called Habocus that's going to build 78 homes. 38 of the homes are going to be uh, f a free full market homes, freehold homes, that'll cross subsidise the land purchase from the government. There'll be 20 social rental homes and there'll be 19 part ownership community land trust homes. And, and already we've reclaimed the allotments yeah. with 15 new allotments and half of the allotment holders were ones that were originally cleared in 1993. Yeah. So it's going to be a really model, a, a model of a sustainable neighbourhood with passive house um, the energy idea is saving. To get land into public ownership, is that right? Well, it's it's already publicly owned by a government body, but the idea of the land trust project, and this is one of the national exemplar projects, is to develop civil society, community-based forms of land trust teaship, so that local bodies democratically accountable to the local community, one person, one vote, open membership, own land and property for long-term community benefit, like the Village Green, but also for specific projects like farming, housing, um, theatre, public facilities, and to take them off the market, so it's not private ownership, it's not state ownership, it's community-based, civil society, land trust ownership. And to what extent are these ideas inspired by things that Rudolf Steiner said? Well, Steiner had this basic idea that land is not a commodity, um, but is a right. Like capital and labour, they shouldn't be treated as commodities. So his question was, how can we develop forms um, of um, community land trusteeship so that we can share the benefits and uh, if you like the the toxic effect of the land market which is causes so much inequality can be removed but nevertheless he was interested in the preservation of initiative as well as community benefit so it's a trade-off and, and, and in terms of farming, this is very relevant, isn't it? Absolutely relevant. So, what, if you like, one of the biggest global movements um, is the community-supported uh, uh, agriculture movement. And um, biodynamically um, run farms have found that a farmland trust is essential for their thriving and survival. So in Britain, Tablehurst and Plorhatch are outstanding examples of well-run BD farms, but they lease from a land trust. And we've, we've now set up a national biodynamic land trust project to, with um, a generous gift from a patron to create more land, land trusteeship lands so we can increase biodynamic acreage. Because at the moment, we, we, we're in a land um, price bubble. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a piece of land in Sussex that's gone up, th the price has gone up 300% from £80,000 to £250,000 apparently in 10 years. And there's no way an ordinary farm business growing vegetables or wheat or, or fruit can, 
can earn the interest you need to pay on the mortgage for that hugely inflated land price. So that much is, if you like, the agricultural value, what you can grow, and that much is estate value. You know, I like living on this beautiful estate and, I can, and there's nobody for miles. And also that's hope value, the, the hope value from perhaps being able to build houses. So the aim of the land trust is to, to put land into trust to make it possible for young entrant farmers to get hold of farms and also communities to get hold of local nutritious food. So it's a real challenge. How, you know, how do we go beyond the market? And Steiner's genius in insight was to see well before our time the, the toxic effects of treating land as a commodity. I don't know if that makes sense, makes sense. but, but it also applies to capital. So, you know, his, his thoughts about capital as trusteeship, similar to Gandhi, similar to John Ruskin, um, similar to Quakers like Cadbury of that time, led, for example, to the, the doc, Dr. Hausch co company, the cap capital is owned in a, a Commonwealth form. So that, that business, the Dr. Hauschka business, can't fl flog it off on the market. And, and that capital, like John Lewis, is, is preserved for the business, for suppliers, for customers and, and staff. So it's an incredibly powerful and practical idea. And as we, as we face a global economic crisis, one major cause of which is be, to treat capital and land as a commodity. You know, think of the great African and South American land grabs going on at the moment with national governments like Korea and Middle Eastern companies buying or leasing huge areas in Africa and displacing the Africans. They're repeating what happened in Britain with the enclosures in England and the, and the clearances in Scotland. They're repeating it there and of course we're still living with, with the clearances and enclosures here. So if you like, the aim of the land trust movement is to reclaim our land. And the reason we called the local land trust, Gloucestershire Land for People, because people like Winston Churchill in 1909 had a great election speech in which he proclaimed land for people. Because you know, he could also, like many people, also Steiner, in his time saw the evils of the land monopoly, he called it. And um, so we called it this, our land trust in, in Stroud, Gloucestershire Land for People in Winston Churchill's honour. And one thing Winston's did say was, first we, um, we shape our buildings and our structures and then they shape us. So that's why land trusts are one way of um, pushing back the market. The setup for the land is that we have a land trust here, St Anthony's Trust, which was set up in the 1970s uh, to support biodynamic agriculture and the training of biodynamic farmers, amongst other purposes. It owns the estate here, which it acquired from Emerson College. Uh, and the reason behind that was to protect the land in perpetuity for biodynamic farming, so that the farmers can do what they need to do uh, and when they're ready to leave, new farmers can come, but the land will always remain. And part of our longer-term purpose here is to secure more land into the trust for biodynamic farming. Do you think that that is a pattern that can develop for the future, then? I think it can develop. I think it has to develop. I think we have to find ways of doing it, because while land is part of an investment market, uh, biodynamic farming, any form of sustainable farming, is insecure. This is long-term farming and it needs a long-term commitment from community and a long-term commitment to the land. So there are land trusts starting and people are willing to support them and you know, we are finding that more people are coming towards it, but it needs to grow. To what extent do, do these ideas come from Rudolf Steiner? Oh, I think directly from Steiner. I mean, the, the threefold order is, is alive and well. While you've got land, farmers and community separate but working together, each with their own part to play. And this is really the successful thing, that with the land, the farmers can plan production, uh, you know, knowing what the community want and being part of it, but also knowing what the land needs. 
and the community can form an etheric around the farmers and the land to support them in a way that is really quite different from, from conventional work. So it's, it's elegant and it's here and it's in this farm. It's been working for a long time. Was Steiner trying to get that idea off the ground during his own lifetime then? I'm not enough of a scholar of Steiner yeah. to know that very well, but it certainly sits behind the agriculture lectures and it sits behind the impulse there that, that the care for the land must be central and that's the job for the farmers, it's the job for the community to support the farmers and then the land will yield for, for all. And so it's, it's there writ large. I feel. Yeah, yeah, good. And it's going well here. I mean, it seems to be flourishing. I mean, you're... this far, yes. Yeah. yeah, I think on all scores, when one looks at uh, the land itself, it is in better heart now than it was when the farm took over. Um, uh, you know, one can see it's it's becoming more resilient to climate change, and and you know, this is a long-term process, and. The farmers, of course, are changing the way they do things. Community is with us all the way through the recessions. People have continued to, to support the farm. And as an organism, as a farm organism, it's, it's alive. It's got a great team here. It's drawing apprentices in and all sorts. So, uh, you know, when we bring other farmers here to look at it, what they see is a very vibrant farm that uh, that bucks the commercial trends but yet is commercially viable and bucks the idea that farmers are separate and isolated but yet you know we have farmers here farming with the latest technology so it's it's working yes